Welcome to Get Moving TV. I'm Dr. Chris Landon and I serve as your host. Here, here in Ventura County, we're really looking, we want to keep business here. I got involved with the Innovation Center with uh, Eric and Brian Went and Matter Labs down in Camarillo at the Ventura County Community Foundation. And we're really looking, how can we bring the engineers together? How can we bring the science together? We have Amgen, we've got Baxter, and we have some seed manufacturing. But this is an agricultural place and we are losing uh, businesses, we're losing uh, people from our population. So what can we do to, to bring uh, modern science here? Uh, in doing so, uh, one of the people who uh, came up is pretty near to us and perhaps we can bring him here and his, his uh, uh, method uh, to Ventura County, uh, Dr. Fishman. So welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Landon. So we were talking just a little bit before, just uh, how did we get into medicine? One of the most popular shows I have is called The Education of a Neurosurgeon and how many years it takes to go and where do you start? So your story, where you end up now as an orthopedic surgeon interested in injury and injury prevention, how, how did it start? Did your, your family, uh, family full of doctors? No, as a matter of fact, uh, my family is a blue collar family. I was brought up in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, my parents, my grandparents, my uncles, they all worked in um, uh, scrap metal. And as I grew up and I went through high school, and I had to work during the, the summers and through colleges, and I worked the forklifts and the dollies and the punch plants, and um, we, I saw a lot of injuries. Uh, and um, I was gave me an interest in uh, how to prevent those kinds of injuries because in the punch plants, people would lose their fingers and hands. Uh, they, the, the forklifts, if they weren't careful, there wasn't, as, that was before OSHA. I'm kind of telling my age a little bit here. We're talking, you know, back in the 1970s. And so um, we saw a lot of injuries and I took a, a lot of interest in, in doing that. In fact, my, my dad came up to me one day and said, you like this work? I go, no, not really. He says, you're a good student continue doing well in college and do something with yourself. And um, I did, I went to medical school. So any other mentors around that time? I mean, your, your dad's got his foot on your rear end there. Yeah, that, that, pushed that, you along. that was pretty much it. My family had no professionals. Mm -hmm. I was the first person to graduate college and the very first person to have a professional degree. My entire lineage is blue collar. So uh, you ended up, you went to, where did you go to medical school? Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit mm -hmm. and received my um, education in uh, orthopedic surgery, which I found interesting because that was the mechanical systems mm -hmm. that I would see injured, I would see hurt when I was, I was on the job and that has my interest. That was at Henry Ford Hospital. Well, people, you know, well, Henry Ford is a pretty remarkable place and people yes, talk, is. you know, has got a mechanical engineer, uh, so I, uh, I think an orthopedic surgeon probably thinks he's a mechanical engineer, not an electrical <laughs> engineer or a civil engineer. But, uh, so yeah, here you are, you're in orthopedics, and how long is that from, from your track from college all the way through your medical school, residency, oh, wow. postgraduate training? Because I want people to get a feel for the yeah, commitments. It's four years of college. I did a year of graduate training in uh, molecular biology, another uh, five years in orthopedic uh, surgery. And so the whole gamut takes, you know, about uh, 15, 16 years well, after that, you graduate uh, high school and stuff. Okay, molecular biology, that doesn't sound like mechanical engineering. So <laughs> were you able to integrate the two? What, what, what kinds of things yeah. are you doing now? When I was going between uh, deciding if I wanted to go to medical school or w more work in the biological sciences, uh, I, I got a, 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 a post uh, uh, graduate um, uh, teach, uh, a position at the university in the uh, biologic programs. And then from there, I even had more of an interest in, in helping people and being a doctor, so I, I went to medical school. So the mechanical engineer, is that interacting with that biologic background now? I mean, how, how do you meld the two yeah. together? You've got a great interest yeah, here. It, it does meld together now. I, I'm doing more with uh, the orthobiologics and using uh, the um, biologic processes for regeneration. So you have to have an understanding of some of the molecular science of cellular biology to know how that particular system works uh, in, the, in the micro area so that you can get a macro picture of uh, the cartilage that you see and how it's regenerating, how it's degenerating, how it affects the, the joint function, the, and how ultimately it affects the quality of life in an individual who starts to lose this ability to function mechanically. Boy, I, I joke with our, our uh, surgeon that if a pediatrician, a surgeon running for an elevator, the pediatrician sticks in his hand and the surgeon will stick in his head. <laughs> 
So uh, it seems like you use both, though. What, 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 what's going on there? So, so tell, tell me a little bit about uh, what it is that you're doing now and, and maybe a couple cases that have been successful in putting that biologic and that mechanical together. Yeah. Um, we're working with um, utilizing stem cell combined with uh, exosomes, which are these biologic um, intracellular uh, vesicles, uh, combined together uh, to instigate regenerative capacity of your body's own intrinsic cellular system. So you have cartilage. It's it's degenerating. You have a disc in your back, and it's slowly getting smaller and smaller, and it's lacking less and less like a good hydraulic function. You're getting more and more chronic back pain. It's making you more and more debilitated. So what we're able to do is we're able, like in typical patient would be someone who has chronic back pain, They've gone through all the treatments. They've had their, their chiropractic, they've had their therapy, their acupuncture, their epidurals, and it hasn't worked. They're still really debilitated, and it's affecting their family life, their personal life, intimacy. And so um, they've been told, well, you have three choices. You know, you're going to live with it, take these pills, and you know what's happened with some of our opioid problem with these chronic back patient patients, or you can have a major surgery. And a lot of times, people don't like those choices. This is another avenue, and it's new. It's, it's orthobiologics, where I can put stem cells in the center of the disc and regenerate some of that intradiscal material, and at the same time, put some into those little facet joints in the back, increase the cartilage stabilization and growth, and over a period of months, this tissue begins to regenerate and stabilize and you'll find and the pain diminishes I've had people that have had their backs and their or their uh, shoulders and knees uh, treated in this manner and over a period of months their pain gets less and less I have some patients who used to use walkers that now use canes I have people that use canes that are now able to walk without w without any kind of a limp can walk the stairs without pulling themselves up by the railing and so we've had some exceptionally good results with using this combination of, of biomaterials, uh, along with things we do just before and just after to help augment the, um, the uh, oxygenation of those tissues and help them function mechanically better. So you can turn water into wine, and, you know, and, and what it, the fact that you're an orthopedic surgeon, such a mechanical guy, but you worry about the, the quality of life. And, and so much of that opioid epidemic it's really treating underlying depression that goes along with the loss of the quality of life, and then they get they get consumed by uh, our friends, the Sacklers. You're and absolutely uh, correct, because you know if you can't function, you can't play with your grandchildren, you can't go out to dinner with your friends because you're the one who's lagging behind. You can't get in and out of your car. Uh, intimacy's out of the question. I mean, it really impacts every single aspect of your life. That's not what we hoped when we got older. Ever, we still want to be vibrant. You still want to be able to interact. And if you can't do that, you're exactly right. We give you pain medicines. Well, that'll make the pain go away. And you go into a depression, and it just spins down out of control, and you, and you lose any quality of life, and enjoyment is gone. And you get constipated. We have a drug for that now. Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah. a, bad, it's, it's a, bad. a bad spiral. So uh, tell me a, a little bit more. I know you have some illustrations uh, of how all these things work. Can you describe some of the things that uh, you see and most be seeing in the pictures? Sure. Um, there's uh, some, um, the first thing is to describe a little bit about stem cell because there's some confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, I get patients ask me all the time, uh, are you taking from abortions? Mm -hmm. uh, are you killing babies? We use perinatal tissue. It comes from the umbilical cord of healthy children after multiple testing of the tissue, both the mom in the third trimester of pregnancy, as well as at the time the baby is born, and then a third party lab has to check as well. So the tissue we know has been checked thoroughly three different times. We don't take aborted tissue, it's not allowed. Number two, an embryonic stem cell is taking a, an egg and a sperm in a petri dish, you let it fertilize. You wait five days until it has a nice little ball we call the blastocyst and we peel that away and we end up with embryonic stem cells. Many people feel that that is, if it's a real embryo, once that's fertilized and you start playing games that you're killing what could have been a human being. 
We don't use embryonics. We don't use fetal. We use the peri-umbilical tissue, which really doesn't have any, any controversy about it. And then fat cells as well. What, what are some other now, sources? Yeah, the other source that we use, uh, that was allergenic cells, because that's from another source. If we take it from your own body, which is the first thing we were allowed to do, we take it from bone marrow. And that has to then be a process in a particular pattern. Then later on, they found that there was a higher mesenchymal stem cell uh, concentration in the adipose tissue or the fat. So they would do like a mini liposuction and you'd put it through a process again. Uh, the FDA is a little critical of that because you're really not supposed to do anything to change it. Minimal manipulation is the wording. And the question is, is that really minimal manipulation or not? And so these are where the controversies are when we take it from the person themselves. So, you know, where is the, so I know the Food and Drug Administration is kind of held off, seeing what people are going to do. Do you see regulation coming over the, over the horizon? We're, you know, we're talking about putting a stem cell lab here in Ventura County, right. and it's a pretty large, much larger than most people think, uh, endeavor to really get something that is certified and can be anticipated in the future to remain certified under new regulations. Uh, correct. What, 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 where do you see these regulations going? It sounds wow. like certainly uh, you're not going to infect anybody with anything yeah. and uh, so forth. Clearly there's going to be regulations. Uh, the regulations are going to be twofold. One is going to be on the laboratory. There's very strict um, um, rules on how you handle any tissue that's going to be transplanted, um, and this is this is a transplant. Make no mistake about it. Even if we, you know, so the they have to be uh, they have to be careful how they handle the tissue to make sure there's no infection. Not only infection caused from the lab, but infection in the processing uh, that they do, and infection intrinsic in the tissue that has to be tested three different times. And you have to document it. You have to make sure. And when I do a, a procedure, I get about a half an inch of laboratory work documenting every single test done by the multiple labs each time proving negativity so that they and they have to see if anything grows out it has to be done just right number two the FDA is very careful and they're very picky on what they will allow the doctors to take out and put into people. It meets several criteria and it's a there's it's called it's code 350, 351 and 361 those aren't so important it's the rules Minimal manipulation, homologous use. You have to use it as you found it. Okay, you can't add anything to it. Be tricky. Add some medications to it or things like that. You take it out as a stem cell. It stays a stem cell. You can't manipulate it or do anything. You have to follow these rules, and they're getting stricter and stricter on the doctors, on the facilities, and then tertiarily on the claims. Don't make ridiculous claims. There's a couple of the labs have already gotten in trouble. 99% certainty we're going to cure. There's nothing. There's nothing in medicine that's 99%, as you well know. And so they they don't want ridiculous claims that they're going to cure your multiple sclerosis. That they're going to cure. They're going to completely cure your stroke. We can improve neurologic function with some of the stem cells. We can't bring back the dead. If cells have died, they've died. But we can help those cells, for instance, the, the, the concussive problems, traumatic, some of the traumatic brain injuries. Some of these cells are living, but they're slowly dropping out from that damage. And we see that in the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We're seeing that in some of our military boys coming back uh, from the war. Uh, they come back having a problem, and we watch that person deteriorate. The question is whether you can save some of that tissue before it actually dies. One of the things that we've started is a 501c3 called Heal Our Patriots. And this is to be able to treat our military, our fire, and our police force that have had injuries and treat them quickly so that we can salvage some of the cell, neural cells that are injured before they go off the deep end and you can't do anything for them. So yeah, setting up a 501c3, you, you're accepting donations now? Or? Not yet. We ha we've gotten the 501c3. The federal government has put their stamp mm -hmm. on it, says, yes, you're okay to do that. And we want to go through this uh, carefully. We're about to get started in doing that and finding the right people in, in, in being able to, to get the donations to help our military. Uh, they gave the police force, 
the military, the firefighters. I, I, you've all watched 9-11. You've seen what's happened in some of our cities and in, in the wars in Iraq. These people are there to help us. They help our communities, our families, our homes. It's nice to be able to do something back for them that hasn't been able to that the routine medical um, uh, treatment protocols haven't been able to accomplish. Well, thank you for uh, for that work. Now, we were talking also a little bit earlier, just uh, there are places that make extraordinary claims and you have to go to Costa Rica or uh, Tijuana and we'll, we'll cure your child's incurable disease. And, uh, you know, I, I don't discourage people, uh, but I certainly don't in, encourage them. And, and seeing the, the, the field mature, uh, where uh, again, how, how much of that do you, do you have to undo in your, uh, in your everyday practice where people, oh, scandal, 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 and... Uh, it, surprisingly, even though the patients are coming there and they're very interested for their own set of problems, they do bring that up. I read in the LA Times this, mm -hmm. or I read in the LA Times that. I heard, I had, went to a lecture and they said I could be cured of this particular problem. And there's a difference between ameliorating a problem, a symptom, and improving your functionality and curing the disease that's giving you the discomfort or the problem. You can't tell somebody who has, you know, a grade three arthropathy of their knee, who is limping in on their, on their walker, you're going to cure them. However, if you put the stem cells in, and you stabilize that cartilage, knock out the inflammatory response from the synovial, that tissue that's in the joint, that can take away the pain, allow better function, and the patient has a better quality of life. If you take that x-ray, guess what? They still have their arthritis, but it isn't giving them those same horrible symptoms and functional deficit. So you have to explain that to the patient. You have to tell them the statistics, because when you look at the published studies on that, it's not 99%, it's not 90%. You have to give them some realistic numbers when you're gonna do this so they don't think this is a definite for me. You're gonna do this for me and I'm gonna absolutely be better. Nothing in medicine, it doesn't matter what pill I give, what surgery I perform, what procedure I do, or what procedure you've done as a physician, nothing you do is 100%. But you have to kind of tell patients the same thing you do with, with any kind of procedure. This is the statistics for what you can expect ac across based on the studies. I can't tell you as a person how you personally are going to do. Only give you some stats. We were also talking a little bit earlier about my good friend Jeffrey Platt at our high school or our medical school uh, reunion said, oh, have I got a pig for you? And he wanted me to go back to Mayo Clinic. and put my DNA into a, a pig so that I would have a heart and a lung and a kidney and so forth. And as it turns out over time, the zoonotic infections, the animal infections just don't work out well. But we have a 3D printer here at that's Ventura Adult Continuing Education. So uh, when are we going to be taking your stem cells and are we printing things out now? Or? Yes, as a matter of fact, and I hadn't thought to bring the... Uh, uh, this came from Columbia University. In Columbia, they have a 3D printer and they're printing out uh, physical parts, like an ear, uh, a nose, people who have basal cell carcinomas that need big resections, or people come back from the military, have pieces of their, of their face missing, that, and they've been able to rebuild those. I, I wish I had thought to bring that. I didn't know you were gonna bring that up. And uh, the Columbia's been able to actually do that through, um, through um, the uh, the poly through 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 our own genetic um, manipulation, they've been able to. It's called inducible pluripotent stem cell. Mm -hmm. They take your cell, put it into a petri dish, mix it with four messenger RNAs, and regress it back to a stem cell, your stem cell. It's literally from you. And then they use that within the 3D printer instead of ink. It's really live cellular tissue, and they can make an ear and they can make a lip that might be missing. And that kind of replacing some of those physical body parts is a lot easier than making a functional like a kidney or something that has a, a, a strong physiologic function. So we're not ready yet to do that. We have made a heart, a single chamber heart. I actually have a nice little picture of that heart bleeding and it was made through 3D and it can't be used in a human, but we're working toward perhaps 
being able to replace functional body parts in the future. So you don't have to sit in bed waiting if you're a heart transplant patient for some young man to die on a motorcycle so you can have his heart. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future that can be built and it also means you won't have to have those anti-rejection drugs that are so terrible cause bad side effects. You get leukemias and lymphomas from long-term use of those, uh, those um, immunosuppressive drugs. Then how, I, I, it's, I'm, no, I'm sure it's more than just uh, squirting in some, uh, some stem cells. In terms of uh, recovery, uh, what, what kinds of things are involved in recovery as well? So you're using physical therapy, occupational therapy? Right. And right. We immediately, uh, because of the, um, the, the physiology involved, you ha can't take any NSAIDs. No non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because those cytokines sometimes have an anti-effect on the various factors that those stem cells are secreting in order to get the cells to regenerate or to stabilize. So for a week before we don't allow anti-inflammatories, for three weeks after we don't. We do want you up and, and we do want a blood flow to the area. Oxygenation of the stem cell is of paramount importance. In order to go through the various cycles to make your energy and your ATP, you need oxygen. If you sit there and you don't move, you're not going to get oxygen blood flow to that area. So if we did a knee or a spine, I want you up and I do want you walking, not excessively. And we don't let you really start a aggressive or any kind of therapy for about three weeks. We don't, we want those cells to take a chance to function um, you know, mechanically and physiologically. So we, we do that as well too. Uh, and then we little by little let get you back to your own functioning. And most people uh, will notice, because it's kind of a bimodal curve as you get better, you have an anti-inflammatory effect and a regenerative effect. So I have people who after four or five weeks will say, I'm doing much better. We didn't regenerate anything that time. But after four, five, six months, there'll be some more permanency to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the effect. So, uh, diet, uh, exercise, uh, so yeah. getting weight off and so forth. Absolutely. Listen, you have, cutting down the weight's good. Also, if you're going to eat, you know, diets makes a big difference in your entire physiology, not just for the stem cells, but for your own cellular mechanism, for your own biochemistry. Same thing with people who smoke. Okay, people who drink too much alcohol, I didn't say you can drink any, but some people drink you know, far too much. Uh, they're highly, they're overweight. They eat far too much saturated um, uh, fats and, and the polyfats. And so this is kind of a bad thing. Why? It clogs the arteries. In order for cells to be functional, they need oxygen. If you don't, if you don't have a good arterial supply and oxygenation, your cells are not going to function at their peak. And so, of course, all that matters. Well, and then how about something maybe a little further out that would be spinal cord injury? Uh, you were, we were talking a little bit about... Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do have a, 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 a video that's interesting to watch. A young man in San Bernardino was in a car accident. Uh, he hit a pole. He broke his neck at about C5, C6. He came in completely paralyzed, just like Steve Reeves had uh, when he had his horse accident. Um, and they had an okay from the FDA to immediately put stem cells into the area of the spinal cord injury. And you can look at the, it shows you the scan, you can see the injury where the, the, uh, the spinal cord is, is really dis almost discontinuous. It really isn't, it's just swollen. And within a short period of time, you'll see a picture of him starting to do some weights. So his upper extremity came back fairly early. His slowly his lower extremity um, starts to come back. That video will bring a tear to your eye, watching this young man who's paralyzed. Can you imagine the cost of taking care of somebody who's in their 20s for the rest of their life that can't move anything other than their mouth and their nose versus somebody, even if he didn't get leg function back, if he can use his arms, imagine how much more freedom that and quality of life he's going to have. And if we could stop spinal cord injury deficiencies that need that kind of care, not, it isn't just a matter of money or the amount of people to take care of them. Uh, the quality of life and the length of life makes a huge difference what we can do for people. Well, I've worked with spinal cord injury for a long time, since the 70s there. And 
It's not that they're not active people to start with. They're, the reason they got there is surfing. They're doing something with extraordinary uh, force that resulted in that kind of, of spinal cord injury. So uh, we did uh, wheelchair basketball where you put the bat on. And right. boy, they would just bang the holy heck out of each other. I was afraid to, <laughs> to get out there. They go, oh, come on, Doc, come on out. And it's not, it's not an easy thing. Well, we've talked a little bit about the who and the what and the where. Uh, where whereabouts are you uh, operating? Yeah. Um, our offices are in Encino, and um, we see patients out of the Encino office. And there's a surgery center, the Regency Surgery Center, right on the Ventura Boulevard. Beautiful uh, plastic surgery center. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yanai owns that, and we uh, do our procedures there. Um, all, everything we do is always done in sterile conditions. Same operating room that I would do an arthroscopy or a carpal tunnel surgery on, it's done sterilely, and that way it limits the chances of infection, just like a real surgery. And we're down to the final minutes here, so the last one is always how much, so. Uh... Well, part of it depends what we're going to be doing. For somebody that we're gonna do spine, which is the most expensive thing we do, uh, if there's multiple levels versus one level, uh, we also have to have an anesthesiologist there for spine. We have to have the fluoroscopy unit. You have to have the fluoroscope tech. So those things tend to cost money. They'll cost between ten and $12,000 to take care of one or two levels, um, including the disc and the facet uh, injections. And usually that'll also include a uh, one or two hyperbaric dives afterward to increase the oxygenation within the uh, actual disc. Well, very good. Uh, then uh, uh, the last would be when, so who, what, where, when, why, and how much. I think we've covered most, just about everything. Uh, as we look at, at bringing this kind of thing to Ventura County, uh, I think probably the stem cell lab is, is a, a big investment, something that, that should be made here. Uh, so Ventura County, uh, you know our, our good doctor here. Uh, you know where to uh, look. Uh, you have a web page that explains uh, some of this, and certainly you can get more information uh, through that web page. Correct. So Ventura County, please support us as we try and build up this business. Uh, think of uh, applications for yourself. Uh, Ventura, it's time to get moving. Mm -hmm.